is our sixth week to discuss the life of David. And we find ourselves uh, in, in a, a kind of tricky predicament here where David has been fleeing from King Saul and he's been hiding in caves. And if you remember last week, he hides in this cave. You know, he loses all his self-respect and he ends up in this cave. And then his family and friends start to join him in the cave. And then pretty soon, all these misfit people start to join him in the cave. People who have debts to pay and people who have problems with, the, with King Saul and who have problems where they're living. They just kind of wonder and they find out that David is in this cave and they, and they gravitate to him. And finally, he ends up with 400 guys in this cave with him. And then that number soon grows to 600. And these eventually become David's mighty men of valor, which is a pretty awesome story. And it's just funny how when you're hurting and you're down and you're low, sometimes people who are also hurting and down and low tend to gravitate to you. That's exactly what happened with David. Well, his men now have grown to 600 and they are still on the run. And when we come to them in chapter 24 of 1 Samuel, we find out, along with King Saul, that they are in the wilderness of En Gedi. And the wilderness of En Gedi is kind of a barren place, and it's near the Dead Sea, and it's like these big, uh, these big cliffs, and they're kind of pockmarked with all these caves. They called it a place of the goats because goats would go in there and hide in the caves. And so it was a great place to hide out because of these big cliffs and then they're, they're honeycombed with all of these caves. And that's where David and his 600 men are hiding out. And, uh, and Saul finds out about this. So we're going to pick it up in verses 2 and 3 uh, of chapter 24 of 1 Samuel. Verse 2 says this, So Saul chose... 3,000 elite troops from all Israel and went to search for David and his men near the rocks of the wild goats. At the place where the road passes some sheepfolds, Saul went into a cave to relieve himself. That's right, you didn't read that wrong. <laughs> you heard it here first. Saul went into a cave to relieve himself, but as it happened, David and his men were hiding farther back in that very cave. So like many of us, Saul's been on a long trip and he needs a potty break, you know? And so he stops off in a cave and, uh, and there he is. And it's just such a weird story. There he is at his most humiliating, you know, vulnerable moment. And there's a bunch of people watching him. I mean, he has no idea, but David and his, and his clan are there in the caves, and they're watching him. Now, we don't know exactly how all this worked. I mean, we don't have every detail of how this worked, but word got to David. I imagine some people kind of whispering, like, oh, my gosh, there's Saul. Somebody get word to David, and David, word gets to David, and David finds out, and he, it's, it, this is a crazy story. But look, can we just start here? Can we just start with the fact that, I mean, you got to love the Bible. you got to love the Bible. People, people, I think, have such a misconception of the Bible, and they think it's this, like, straight-laced book where everything's real clean and neat, and, and, you know, there's no messiness, but it doesn't get any messier than this, if you know what I mean. I mean, this is crazy stuff. And don't you just love the reality of the Bible? I mean, this story is it's got everything. It's kind of gross. It's kind of creepy. It's kind of funny. It's kind of weird. But all told, it's just fascinating. It's just fascinating. And so what we find when we read stuff like this is that the Bible isn't everything that you expect it to be. But it's real. It's real. And that's important for us to realize. So here's this crazy scene. Let's pick it up from here, verse 4. Now's your opportunity, David's men whispered to him. Today the Lord is telling you, I will certainly put your enemy into your power do, to do with as you wish. So David crept forward and cut off a piece of the hem of Saul's robe. 
So David's men are looking, and they're like, this is David's opportunity. This is a golden opportunity. His enemy is right here before him in all his glory, vulnerable, humiliated. Surely this is God delivering him into your hands, David. And David creeps forward, and he does something that I don't think anybody there would have, would have even thought of. And you know his men had to be wondering, like, is he playing some kind of practical joke? <laughs> he creeps over, and he cuts the hem of his robe off. And he doesn't kill him. Why? Why doesn't he kill him? I mean, he's right there. And David's men get kind of irritated, and they're like, dude, you had the perfect chance. You had a golden opportunity. Why in the world didn't you just end this deal? I mean, this guy has been chasing you around, making your life a living hell. This guy is a psychopath. He's a nut job. He's chasing you. Why not just end this deal? But David doesn't do it. Matter of fact, David feels guilty about it. Verse 5, but then David's conscience began bothering him because he had cut Saul's robe. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this to the Lord my king. I shouldn't attack the Lord's anointed one, for the Lord himself has chosen him. So David restrained his men and did not let them kill Saul. Now the rest of 1 Samuel 24 is, uh, is two speeches. In verses 8 to 15, it's David giving a speech to Saul. And then in verses 16 to 21, it's Saul giving a speech back. And I've, I've left out some details, but I, I think I've given you the most important detail here, which is the fact that David did not kill Saul when he had the chance. He had revenge right there in front of him. And he chose not to pursue it. The only thing we have to question is why. Now look, I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you've been tempted to get revenge. My guess is all of us have at some point or another. And we've all had a boss who was a jerk to us at some point or another, or we've all had a friend who let us down, or you may have had a, a spouse who walked out on your marriage, or someone who walked out of a relationship with you, and it hurt, and it was painful, and you were ready to take matters into your own hands and really stick it to this person, because they had passed you over for whatever reason, and you're angry. I think all of us, uh, on some level, have experienced something like that. But here's the thing that we have to remember. And I want you to write this down. If you have a pencil or a pen or anything like that, write this down. We have no control over how people treat us. We have no control over how people treat us, how they talk to us, what they do to us. We can't control those things. But we do have complete control over how we respond. We don't have any control over what they do, but we do have complete control over how we respond. So the question as a Christian that I've got to ask myself is, how do I respond when I've been hurt? How do I respond when I've been wronged? And your choices are limited. Matter of fact, there's only two options. You can either try to get even, or you can do what David did here. I want to go through three reasons why I think David let Saul go. Why he didn't choose revenge. And hopefully we'll learn something as we look at these together. Reason number one is this. David respected 
Saul's authority. He didn't take revenge upon him because he respected his authority. Look at verse 8. After Saul had left the cave and gone on his way, David came out and shouted after him, My Lord, the king! And when Saul looked around, David bowed low before him. David says, My Lord, the king! He bows before him. It's clear, it's obvious that he has respect for this man. Regardless of what he's done. Saul's already tried to kill him once. He's chased him around all over the place. He's taken everything that David had to lean on away from him. And yet David still respects his authority. He still says, look, this is the king. God put him in that position. Who am I to take his life? Not only that, but who am I to, to vandalize his robe? I'm not supposed to do anything against him because I respect his authority. You know, in the army, they say you don't salute the man, you salute the rank. The colonel may be an absolute jerk, but that doesn't matter. You still salute. It's the same way for us. I, you know, I don't hardly ever get political, but you know, regardless of who holds the office, you respect the office. Whether you agree with them politically or not, it doesn't give you license to go and trash the president or anybody else. He respected his authority. Look at verse 10. This very day, you can see with your own eyes, it isn't true. For the Lord placed you at my mercy back there in the cave. Some of my men told me to kill you, but I spared you. For I said, I will never harm the king. He is the Lord's anointed one. Look, understand this. David had every reason to kill Saul. The man was a killer. He was a psychopath. He was a desperate madman who was tormented by a demon. He was prone to fits of rage. He was completely unreasonable. David would have been doing the world a favor and he would have been cheered on by his nation. They would, have, they would have partied in the streets to know that David killed Saul. But he didn't do it because he recognized God's authority over Saul and therefore Saul's authority over him. Secondly, the reason that David didn't kill Saul didn't take revenge on Saul is because David was willing to wait for God to vindicate him. David was willing to wait for God to vindicate him. Verses 11 and 12. Look, my father, at what I have in my hand. It's a piece of the hem of your robe. I cut it off, but I didn't kill you. This proves that I'm not trying to harm you and that I've not sinned against you even though you've been hunting for me to kill me. May the Lord judge between us. Perhaps the Lord will punish you for what you're trying to do to me, but I will never harm you. See, David understood a fact that many of us never grasp, that when it comes to revenge, God is much better at it than we are. When it comes to revenge, God is much better at it than we are. That's because he looks down from heaven and he sees every angle of what's going on. See, our tendency is to be hurt and to justify ourselves. Our tendency is to say, no, that person's bad and I'm good. Look at the way he treated me. Look at the way she treated me. They're bad, I'm good, I did the right things, they deserve everything that's coming to them. 
But God sees from a different perspective. He sees from a different angle. He looks down and he sees everything. He knows every facet of the struggles that we face. And so he's really the only one who's truly qualified to judge. He's really the only one who's truly qualified to take action. David understood that. And he knew that God would have to be the one to vindicate him. That if he tried to do it himself, he would mess it up. He would cross over into God's territory. Y'all know that phrase like, know your role, stay in your lane. You know, know your role. And your role is, is not to vindicate yourself. That's God's role. Your role is to seek Him. David was willing to wait for God to vindicate him. Reason number three why David didn't take revenge upon Saul is he didn't seek revenge because he did not want to descend to Saul's level. He didn't want to get down into the mud where Saul was. Saul was crazy. Saul was acting insane, and he didn't want to get down and descend into that level. He wanted to rise above it. That's what God had called him to do. Verse 13, as that old proverb says, this is David quoting, as that old proverb says, from evil people come evil deeds, so you can be sure I will never harm you. I'm not going to get in the mud with you, Saul. I'm not going to go there with you. You've been after me, but I'm not going to go there with you. I'm not fighting fire with fire. Doesn't that sound like something your mom used to tell you? <laughs> David's he's saying, if I attack him, I'm only sinking down to his level. I've heard it said this way, never wrestle with a pig because you get dirty and the pig loves it. <laughs> don't wrestle with the pig. Don't, don't allow yourself to get down into the mud with other people. People love to get in the mud. Just look at social media. I like looking at Twitter. And, and when I... When I got up yesterday, it was a couple hours, I got ready, everything. First, first thing I saw when I looked at Twitter was a guy had posted, Hello, Twitter. I wonder what people are going to be offended by today. <laughs> and that's kind of what social media has turned into. It's like this breeding ground for offense and, and, and vile comments and vitriol against each other. And it's, it's just become a real toxic place. Because people love to go to social media to, to air their differences and to air their problems. And I've been tempted to do so. Y'all don't know how many times I've written some response and then said, you know what, never mind. Delete. It's not worth it. It's not going to go anywhere anyway. See, we can't get down into the mud with people and we've got to watch every single word that we say. And what you realize is that when you, when you recognize that vengeance really is God's, that vindication really is his role and not yours. When you realize that, you realize that the saddest part about trying to get even is that it makes you the victim of the person that you're mad at. You become the victim of that person. They're not thinking about you anymore. They've moved on with their life. But you're letting them take up rent in your head. And you live in debt to them. It's a weird kind of debt because they, they owe me an apology. They, they, they owe me this. They should make this right for me. 
And until they do, you can never be happy. But they're doing fine. Ultimately, it drags you down in the sewer where your enemies dwell. And the moral filth that covers them soon covers you as well. So let me repeat what I said earlier. We cannot control what people say about us or do to us. And in this world, we're going to get hurt again and again and again. People are going to fail us. Some will misunderstand us. Others will doubt our integrity. And some will judge us as a threat. For every David, there's a Saul. And there's somebody who's going to twist everything that you do and make it wrong. Are you going to waste your time trying to, to, to battle that person? Or are you going to move on with your eyes on the Lord? So how do we respond when people mistreat us? What's the best way to respond? I'm going to give you three things. The first is shut up. Oh, my gosh, that felt good. I've been waiting to tell you all that for so long. <laughs> when you are hurt or angry, you got to watch your words. Watch what you say. Watch what you vent. See, one of the things I love about this story is that David went right out of that cave and went straight to Saul. He didn't go to a friend. He didn't go to a family member. He went right out of that cave and he went straight to Saul with his offense directly to him. And every word that he said was so careful and calculated and really beautiful. It's poetic what he said. The angry people say and write things that they later regret. I never met somebody who regretted what they didn't say. But I met plenty of people who regretted what they said. Especially in anger. Kim and I have a little saying in our marriage. We discuss hot topics during cool times. Because if we're both hot and geared up and angry, it's going to go bad places. But if we wait and we shut up and we show some restraint, and then when things have cooled off, we talk about it, it usually goes so much better. Proverbs 10, 19, I love this verse. Too much talk leads to sin. Be sensible and keep your mouth shut. Secondly, look up. Don't just shut up. Look up. Look up and place your focus on Jesus and remember how he acted when he was wronged. Remember what 1 Peter 2, 22 to 24 says. He never sinned nor ever deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted nor threatened revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God who always judges Fairly, He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, you are healed. When he was mocked, he didn't retaliate. When he hung on the cross between two thieves, crucified for crimes that he did not commit, all he did was look out and say, Father, forgive them they don't know what they're doing. He is our ultimate example. I don't know how he did it. It's because he's perfect. And he can be perfect in you too. But you got to look up in order for him to live through you. Thirdly, lighten up. Shut up, look up, lighten up. Well, I get to yell at y'all today. It's awesome. 
Lighten up. Seriously, the world needs to lighten up. Amen? Amen. People are so uptight these days and so wound up and so angry with each other. We just all need to lighten up. Everybody needs to take a breath. Do it right now. (sighs) Do it. Oh, man, doesn't that feel good? Take a breath. Sooner or later, you got to lay down your arms and you got to quit fighting a battle. It's exhausting to fight. And those of you who are in the middle of a fight right now, you're probably so tired, just worn out. I loved it the other night. You know, we, we are going to launch a, a marriage ministry in our church in, in, in August. And I think it's going to be so helpful to so many people. It's called Reengage, And right now we're going through it with, with some folks who are going to help me lead it. And I loved it because one of the couples the other night said, who'd been married 63 years, they said, you know what? We just decided one day that we were no longer going to be offended by each other. We just decided one day, I'm not going to, it's not good for us. We don't have the energy to, to fight anymore. We're just not going to be offended by each other anymore. We're going to choose to believe the best about each other. It was awesome to hear. And I, I think we need that more, not just in our marriages, but in our world. We need to choose not to be offended by each other anymore and just deal with our differences in civil and kind ways. We need to lighten up. I read a story in in preparation for this message about uh, two monks, an older monk and a younger monk, and they had their vow of silence, and they also had to take a vow that they would never touch a woman. And they were walking on a hike one day, quietly, And they saw a woman near the river, and and the river was was flowing pretty steadily, and she was crying. It was an old woman. And as they approached, the woman said, I can't get across, and I've got to get across to get home. What am I going to do? And the older monk walked over to her, and he, he picked her up without saying a word, and he walked her across the river and he set her down on the other side and she went on her way and they went on their way and they, they hiked for another two hours and the whole time the younger monk was just seething, just angry. How could he touch this woman? We took a vow. Finally, he couldn't contain himself any longer, and the young guy blurted out, My Lord, why did you carry that woman across the river? You know that we're not supposed to touch a woman. And the older monk looked down at the young man, and he said, I put her down two hours ago. Why don't you put her down too? It's a good question. Some of you are walking in here and you're carrying all kinds of stuff. And it's not affecting anybody else but you. It's not bothering anybody else but you. It's not limiting anybody else but you. But you are so weighed down and bogged down by stuff that you can't control or do anything about. Maybe you need to put it down. And you need to shut up about it. And you need to look up about it. And you need to trust the Lord. Because he is always faithful. Will you pray with me? While your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. I want you to think of that person that you're resentful toward right now. Go ahead and name them in your mind.
And I want you to fill in the blank. I'm going to lead us in a prayer, and I want you to fill in the blank with that person's name. Heavenly Father, I thank you that Jesus Christ took my sins when he didn't deserve them. And I confess to you that I am resentful toward blank. Even though Jesus Christ died for my sins, I am angry because of what blank has done. So, Father, I ask you to do what you think is best in this situation. No longer allow me to harbor anger and bitterness. Set me free from this bondage. And please keep me from it for the rest of my life. Teach me to forgive just as David did. Teach me to forgive just as Jesus did. And I pray this in the name of Jesus who forgave all my sins. Amen.